you referred to us. So as early as February, there were discussions on already on how we would be managing this patient. The flow of patients have been discussed as well. Sometime in March, our, our division has decided on to look into how we would be managing our patients. And because of, of uh, scanty data during that time and experiences coming from China, we came out with this initial recommendation on respiratory management for severe acute respiratory illness. So these patients with SARI that are deemed to be COVID suspect, probable, or COVID confirmed can present with any of the following symptoms. So dyspnea, uh, desaturations of less than 93% at room air, a PF ratio of less than 300 or increasing in lung infiltrates of more than 50% for their baseline. We classify or stratify patients by severity using PF ratios at that time. These are the diagnostics that we request for all our, the patients that will be referred to us. Take note that during this time, chest CT scan is already there. We did have collaborations with our Department of Radiology so that we can do early CT scans in, in some of our patients, especially during this time we're in the speed at which the results are coming in were, were not as fast as we have them right now. So for patients whose PF ratio is still between 300 to, uh, to 200, then we, this is what we usually do. We give them high flow, uh, we, we place them on low flow oxygen devices using nasal cannulas uh, and face masks, as well as those be, uh, between 200 to 300. But when patients' PF ratio falls below 200, the dictum at that time was we, we consider intubating this patient and we refer these patients to our anesthesia service who are the deemed expert for maintaining airways for rapid sequence intubation. And we follow traditional ARDS ways of management using lung protection strategies, um, using PEEP tables to adjust our PEEP requirements, keeping our plats below 30 and our driving pressures below 14. We, when we escalate these patients, we either sedate, paralyze, we have, been, have, we have experience with doing all of this, proning, APRV, and of course, we, we have been seeing patients during the first weeks of our uh, care, patients were dying, so we did have a lot of prayers incorporated into our day-to-day -day activities as well. We were looking into limiting aerosolization in this group of patients because of the potential risk for um, dispersing a lot of these um, particles that may be infectious to other people and also to our healthcare workers. So we were limiting our bag mask valve ventilations with filters. We, we had a no nebulization policy. And to do that, we used bronchodilator patches if we needed to bronchodilate these patients. We are able to deliver bronchodilators through an MDI port in the ventilator circuitry. We instituted that we will not do bronchoscopic procedures at that time as it wasn't clear how we would be going about uh, preventing aerosolization procedures as well. We had a no NIV policy and at that time, the institution did not have access to high flow nasal cannula and because of the concerns on dispersions and aerosolizations, we opted not to do any NIV and high flow at that time. So again, the move was to classify patients with PF ratio and this is how we were managing and we do intubations earlier on these patients. And the reasons behind this came from the initial studies. You will be familiar with this initial Lancet study, which was probably one of the first papers on the 2019 NCOV at that time, looking into 41 patients with a 15% mortality, and that they were narrating to us that the time to ARDS is about two days from hospital admission, and there was mounting evidence of a rapid deterioration of these hypoxemic patients leading to intubation. The thought at that time is that we should be doing early elective intubation early because we wanted to support these hypoxemic patients who have a potential for rapid deterioration. And we wanted to, be, to do this elective so that we will limit the potential risk for the patient because um, too late intubation increases the risk of complications because we will need to do rapid sequence intubation and the paralytics and sedatives when being given at the late in the course of the respiratory failure may lead to some complications like arrest or worsening of their hypoxemias or arrhythmias. 
And we wanted to do it also as an elective because we want to limit the exposure of our healthcare worker team. We wanted to plan out all of these intubations for our patients. Uh, we were following the, the data coming from the ARDS. So we now know that ARDS follows a definition from the Berlin consensus. We looking into the timing, the imaging, and they are able to differentiate ARDS severity between mild, moderate, and severe. And the reason behind this mild, moderate, and severe is because of the retrospective review on the mortality that it carries with them. And this is the reason why we are, our cutoffs at that time were placed at uh, 200 is because of these um, increasing mortality about 32% at that time. And the management from the ARDS um, uh, journals would tell us that when patients uh, fall below 200, then those are the times that we instituted a lot of these ventilatory maneuvers. Hence, the, the protocol that we were following at that time used a cut of about 200. And for ARDS, the guide to management is knowing the pathophysiology of ARDS and the concept of the baby lung. So we have been uh, taught in medical school that the ARDS lungs can be differentiated into different zones. Zone A will be this area of collapse and atelectatic lungs that are the most dependent. And we have the zone B, which are relatively the aerated parts of the lungs. And we have a zone C between the zone A and B that are the areas that are at risk for recruitment and recruitment injury. And so the goal of management is to maximize the recruitment in the zone C and hopefully recruit some of the lung tissue on zone A without harming the lung tissue in zone B. The lung tissue in zone B has been the what we call as the baby lung. And this is the reason why part of lung protection strategy was really to give low tidal volume ventilation, about six to eight mils per kilogram body weight, because the volume that can be accommodated is distributed predominantly into the B zone. And for us to recruit the area in zone C and zone A is that we do give them pressure that's uh, positive and expiratory pressure. And CT scan imaging studies have shown to us that increasing PEEP in highly recruitable or recruitable lungs can improve um, opening of the dependent portions of the lungs that are suffering from ARDS. When we do lung inflations or when we do recruitment in these patients, we do experience an increasing in the plateau pressure. And so the plateau pressure had been one of our guides into determining what is the seeding of the peak expirat and expiratory pressure that we have been giving. For the past five years, we have been showing also that it's not only the P plateau pressure that is important, but also the driving pressure. And this, this graph coming from the retrospective review of Professor Amato tells us that the driving pressure has a bearing on the mortality of our patients. So it is not only important that we increase the PEEP of our patient, but we also look into ways of making sure that the driving pressures are kept at the minimum. And rather than looking at us targeting a, a delta P or a driving pressure, the move has been to really not exceed a certain plateau, uh, a certain driving pressure. And algorithms such as the one here shown on, your, on the slide tells us that maybe the way to protect that lung and to maximize lung recruitment was to provide enough PEEP to our patients without exceeding a certain limit of the driving pressure. In this case, they have been saying that the driving pressure should be always kept below 15 centimeter water. So during that time, the guidance from our group was that we will apply PEEP in our patients not to exceed our PEEP plateau pressures and also our driving pressures. Keeping in mind also that it is not only important to oxygenate or uh, improve oxygenation in our patient, but the ventilatory strategies carry with them uh, problems of lung injury. It has been established for the past two to three decades that, that ventilation can carry some problems such as volutrauma and virotrauma. And this, uh, this then the way to circumnavigate this problem is to place limits on how much volume and how much pressure you would be giving to your patient. 
and giving the PEEP to your patient without causing them to have their recruitment of what we call atelectrauma. Throughout the years also, we have been introduced to the concept of biotrauma, where in over the standing portions of the lungs, for example, the BB lung, the ones and zone, um, and the top upper part of the lung, if you over distend them, they do uh, the stretching of this particular portion of the lung can incite signals that can increase cytokines and you can have a biotrauma as well in this patient. Over the past two to three, uh, past five years, a new concept of lung injury has come forth, which we call as the patient self-inflicted lung injury, wherein patients with rigorous breathing can now cause some degree of uh, trauma as well into the lung parenchyma. And so the move really right now is to maximize ventilatory support without you doing uh, ventilator-induced lung injury, but at the same time, reducing the work of breathing of your patient so that you don't incite a lot of PCL or patient self-inflicted lung injury. So let me take you to three cases that have... Um, that have altered the way we have been managing our patients. And these are cases that I have handled. So the first is a 67-year-old diabetic female who's hypertensive and was admitted for fever and cough. And these were the CT scan findings of that patient. She had increasing oxygen requirements but did not report shortness of breath. Objectively, she was tachypneic at 26 to 28 breaths per minute. In two days, the oxygen support had to be raised to 12 liters per minute via face mask just to maintain a saturation of about 93%. If you take a look at these CT scan images, it's very typical of the COVID-19 pneumonia that you see. Diffuse ground glassing predominantly on the periphery. But if you look into whether this depicts the typical ARDS picture, you would see that you're not able to delineate the zones A, B, and C consistent with what we have on our AR, usual run-of-the-mill ARDS patient. So this patient's PF ratio was a, went down to about 172. He, she had to be intubated and placed on lung protection strategy. She turned sour and had an increasing O2 requirements needing for us to sedate, paralyze, and uh, eventually place this patient on prone positioning. We felt this patient was developing cytokine release syndrome um, so this patient was given tocilizumab, but despite all our efforts on ventilating and the management for the cytokine release syndrome, this lung really worsened and this patient died. The next is a 64-year-old male diabetic and obese patient who came in for shortness of breath as well. This is the CT scan of this patient upon admission. If you look into the CT scan, you would see those diffuse ground glassing Again, typical of COVID-19 pneumonia, but they are now with bigger involvement in this particular patient. You would still see that there are areas, for example, in this one, wherein there are no lesions. Again, not typical of the ARDS picture that we have. Usually, we see the ARDS patients having most of the dependent portions that are quite affected. The PF ratio of this patient on admission was 106 he was given 12 liters per minute of oxygen support via face mask with a rebreather. The saturations were barely at 91 to 92%, and this patient was, having, um, uh, was able to speak in phrases. At that time, the dilemma was really to intubate this patient, or can we bridge this patient and manage this patient without getting him intubated? So we jacked up our O2 support to 15 liters per minute and kept our saturations at about 93%. This patient had a, co had a contact with COVID-19 patient. And even on this admission, we don't have the results yet of the RT-PCR. We treated this patient as COVID-19 pneumonia with ARDS. And an immediate tocilizumab was given, eventually completed two doses in 48 hours. This patient was placed on uh, experimental COVID medications of hydroxychloroquine, but developed QT prolongation on the second hospital day. So he was shifted to ritonavir and liponavir. He was also placed on hemoperfusion after the first tocilizumab and was able to complete all the doses of hemoperfusion. This patient survived. He was discharged, improved, and never got intubated. And we just placed his patient on O2 support with face mask rebreather and had a careful titration and monitoring of his response to this treatment. 
The last patient is a 72-year-old male, a post-TB treatment patient with a history of allergic rhinitis and was lost to follow up from my clinic for about a year. We were planning to work up this patient for possible asthma. And this patient came in for fever already during that time that community transmission is happening already in the country. The PE at that time showed that this patient had bilateral wheezing and a PF ratio was 124. The O2 support given was about 15 liters per minute, but this patient was still having desaturations. So this patient at that time had access to high-flow nasal cannula. So we placed this patient on high-flow nasal cannula. He received IV hydrocortisone for the consideration of a possible exacerbation of asthma as well. Received tocilizumab 2 doses for the consideration of ARDS, hydroxychloroquine, and hemoperfusion. This patient survived. The improvement, however, was quite slow, and we had a very long course that this patient had been placed on high-flow nasal cannula and was eventually sent home after five weeks of being treated in the hospital. So at that time, the observations that we have had is that we do see hypoxemic patients, but some of them do not feel short of breath. We are able to see that there is an increase in their respiratory rate, and this can be already a surrogate for us that there is increased work of breathing in this patient. There are patients who have rapid decline in PO2, but we were now starting to challenge whether our PF ratio of 200 was really a very high cutoff to intubate a lot of these patients. We were giving P progressively and it were, it were, we were increasing it to reach a certain target PO2, but we were quite worried that we might have been doing some VLI as well or ventilator-induced lung injury with the increasing P. Um, initial experience from, from data from China and Japan tells us that not too much PEEP is being required, but in some of our patients, we really needed a lot of PEEP um, for us to improve that oxygenation. And we felt that maybe we were doing proning quite late, and this translated to us not improving outcomes. Around this time, also issues on dispersion of the virus with high-flow nasal cannula has been um, uh, answered with some of the data that we have seen on experimental uh, models showing that dispersion with high-flow nasal cannula can be reduced. We now know that COVID-19 um, pneumonia pathophysiology, the problem is that your SARS-CoV-2 usually creates an injury to your alveolar type 2 cells, macrophages, and the epithelial cells. And this leads to that selective loss of the surfactant, atelectasis. And this is the usual typical patient that we see with, with common ARDS. And these patients who have prolonged recovery periods, depending on the recovery of these cell cells that are affected. So, but the Italian group, this is the paper from Professor Gattinoni, have shown to us that we, they have been seeing patients with very low PF ratios but the CT scan findings are not consistent with the usual run-of-the-mill ARDS that we have, similar to the patients that have been shown in the three examples that I have told you. So right now, there have been questions on what is the evolution of the disease in COVID-19 pneumonia. So the paper from Professor Gattinoni tells us that maybe there are two phenotypes of COVID-19. We have the L-type pneumonia, wherein these are patients with low elastans, low VQ, and the hypoxemia might be not really related to the parenchymal damage, but because of this loss of regulation of perfusion by loss of that hypoxic vasoconstriction. These patients have very low lung weight, and hence there is probably no need to, get, to do recruitment in this patient. Okay. Now, this loss of hypoxic drive probably is coming from the fact that your SARS-CoV-2 has been shown also to affect your ACE2 uh, receptor in the pulmonary endothelium. So again, the ACE2 downregulates your angiotensin 2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. So they have shown that infection with SARS-CoV-2 impairs that pathway that may lead to an imbalance between your ACE and your ACE2 pathway that leads to uncertain effects on hypoxic vasoconstriction. So this really leads to impairment and induces a lot of the shunt and the resultant hypoxia. And this can be the reason why your patients are quite hypoxic and yet they do not feel that they are really short of breath. And, and this um, and probably the reason why you have this L-type of pneumonia uh, on this patient. And the management for this L 
pneumonia uh, phenotype will be just to give a higher FiO2, maybe using high flow nasal cannula and non invasive ventilation. If they get intubated and you place this patient on lung protection strategies of about six to eight mils per kilo, their hypercapnia would often respond with a higher tidal volume. They probably have lower PEEP requirements. And according to Professor Gatinoni, maybe these patients don't need to be prone. But we will show you that maybe even if your patients are on high flow nasal cannula, there might be benefit of doing uh, self proning in this patient. Then we have on the other end of the spectrum, the H-type pneumonia, the usual run-of-the-mill ARDS cases that we have uh, manifested by high elastance, a high right-to-left shunting, a very high lung weight, and these patients have potential for lung recruitability. And the management for this particular group of patients is really to intubate them and treat them as ARDS, provide them with higher PEEP, do early proning, and consider ECMO. Now, rather than looking into that maybe some patients are L-type and maybe some patients are H-type, the dictum right now is maybe this is actually a continuum and that your L-type pneumonia patients, when they are not properly taken care of with the increase in work of breathing, they go into an H-type pneumonia because of a development of this PCV. So the management should actually be addressing patients at the L-type phase and maybe mitigating them from doing PCLE so that they won't go into an H-type pneumonia later on. So the management of COVID-19 respiratory failure is a balancing act. We need to look into averting the invasive ventilation and the potential for villi, and then balancing them as well with the harms of not intubating your patient and having them with a lot of strong efforts that can lead to PCLE that can cause increasing lung stress. And again, the risk of delaying your intubation. So this is the thing that you should be looking into when trying to manage these patients with COVID-19 respiratory failure. The uh, PGH and the division follows the stratification or the labeling of our COVID-19 patients coming from the uh, Philippine Society of Infectious and Microbiology, uh, Microbi uh, the Peacefeed Society looking into A, B, C, and D patients. A lot of the patients that will be referred to pulmonary and the ICU will be the type C and D because these are the ones with severe acute respiratory infection or those with already a critical illness. But we do get referrals on the group B patients that have been showing some an increasing need for oxygen support. And right now, these are the things we have been doing for this COVID-19 patients. We're giving non-invasive ventilatory support through low flow oxygen systems, we've been doing high flow already. And in the future, we will do non-invasive ventilation. And for the severely ill and the ones with, with um, fulminant respiratory failure, then we do invasive ventilatory support. The oxygen support in hypoxemic uh, failure patients tells us that the supplementation is recommended to start when your O2 saturation is already below 90%. The SECM and the ESICM tells us that adult COVID-19 patients can be started on O2 support if they are already below 92%, although that is a weak recommendation. In adults with COVID-19 and acute hypoxemic failure, the target SpO2 would be to maintain no higher than 96%. So the target will be from between 93 to 96% in this patient. And this is consistent, I think, with what the WHO tells us, that it is recommended an immediate administration of supplemental oxygen therapy to any patient who has emergency signs or to any patient without emergency signs, but their SpO2 is below 90%. So the emergency signs that the WHO has, tell, has been telling us will be if there is any obstructed or absent breathing, a severe respiratory distress, central cyanosis, if there is shock, coma, and or convulsions in this patient. So how have our protocols or management changed um, over the past few months? So right now, we still get referrals. These are the patients that will be referred to us. COVID-19 patients with severe acute respiratory illness manifested by any one of the following. And once we see this patient, the first thing we need to look into is, is there an immediate need to intubate this patient? And these are the things we look into. Is this patient having a decrease in the sensorium, a hemodynamic instability, or a cardiac arrhythmia that is becoming unstable? 
or an imminent arrest. So if this patient fulfills any of this, this patient will be sent to an intubate, will undergo the intubation protocol and referred to anesthesia service for a rapid sequence intubation. If none of these were present, this patient will be provided oxygen support via either nasal cannula or face mask with or without rebreather. And we place a surgical face mask on top of the system to limit dispersion. We monitor and observe these patients for their response. Again, our targets will be an SpO2 between 93 to 96%. And we look into their, the effect of the therapy, which should be manifested by a decrease in work of breathing in this patient. Now, we monitor these patients for signs of worsening of the respiratory failure. If there are no signs of worsening, we continue our present support. If their SpO2 falls below 92% or respiratory distress ensues, the next thing we look into is if there is hypercapnia. Around that time, our blood gas would be available. And if these patients have hypercapnia, we immediately place this patient on an intubation protocol. In the coming weeks, once we get approval for the full face mask venti, we might be able to do that non-invasive ventilation as a bridge to, to these patients um, with hypercapnia and hypoxemia as well. If there is no hypo hypercapnia occurring in this patient, we place them on high-flow nasal cannula. We monitor their response and do our ROCS index. So the recommendations for high-flow nasal cannula, these are the ones coming from the SECM, tells us that it can be used um, if conventional oxygen therapy has been failing. Now, the ANZIX uh, group has been telling us that the high-flow nasal cannula in the ICU is recommended as a therapy for associated COVID-19 disease as long as the staff are protected. The risk of airborne transmission is quite low with well-fitted and newer high-flow nasal cannula systems. So the WHO tells us that the high-flow nasal cannula may be safe in patients with mild, moderate, and non-worsening hypercapnia, again with stability of the mental status, hemodynamics, and no need for emergent intubation. Patients receiving high-flow nasal cannula should be monitored closely for need for escalation. And again, do not delay the need for intubation if there is an indication that has been presenting as well. So the high-flow nasal cannula therapy is able to deliver us, depending on the source of your wall oxygen, to about 100% FiO2 through nasal prongs. And this is not painful to your patient's nasal passages because this is humidified and heated. And the, um, the reason why high-flow nasal cannula works in these patients is because you're able to reduce their work of breathing because the flow you are giving in this patient is higher than what their inspiratory flows are. A lot of our patients who are dyspneic will need higher inspiratory flows to get the air that they needed. But because your high-flow nasal cannula produces or the flow you're going to deliver is higher than what the patient is needing, you're able to reduce that work of breathing in your patient. And again, if you're on the L type of, pneumo of uh, phenotype in this patient, then maybe you prevent this patient from going into PCL. So all of these settings can be controlled by the clinician or your respiratory therapist and allows for a greater confidence in the delivery of the supplied oxygen. So we, in the Philippine General Hospital, our initial settings are the flow rates are tempered flows. So we do not give flows that are quite high, meaning a lot of the flows are 60 to 80 in the traditional patient. But for this particular group of patients, we start between 20 to 35 liters per minute, and we jack up our FiO2 to set a target of the side peripheral oxygen saturation. We adjust our flow rates by increments of 5 to 10 liters per minute. If the patient's respiratory rates fail to improve, the oxygenation fails to adequately improve, or the breathing remains labored in this patient. To limit dispersion, we place a surgical mask on top of this patient's high-flow nasal cannula. We place this patient, of course, in our COVID areas wherein all our personnel are wearing proper PPEs, ideally instituted in a negative pressure environment, and in a setting where you are able to monitor the need for escalation. So a lot of these patients on high-flow have been transferred to our ICU for close monitoring. And if our ICUs are full, we place them on the part of the wards wherein the, the nurses can actually see them more readily and closely. 
we de-escalate or shift them to low flow systems once we're able to taper their flow rate to less than 20 liters per minute and an FIO2 of less than 50%. Again, we do ABGs in this patient immediately after an hour and see if there is some improvement. Now, placing a surgical mask on top of the oxygen delivery system, for example, in your high-flow nasal cannula at 40 liters per minute, has been shown to reduce aerosol dispersion. And this is the reason why we are able to do this high-flow nasal cannula, provided we have them place a face mask, a simple face mask on this patient, uh, a simple surgical mask on this patient. And then, again, all our personnel are wearing the proper PPEs. Our targets for this patient is a saturation between 93 to 96%. Again, an effect on the work of breathing. This patient's blood gas should not show any respiratory acidosis. And we monitor the ROX index in this patient at 2 hours, 6 hours, and even at 12 hours. And we see if there is worsening or improvement in the ROX index. So the ROX index is computed this way. It's the... Uh, we, Everything is readily available at the bedside. You know your oxygen saturation, how much FiO2 you're delivering through your high-flow nasal cannula system and the patient's respiratory rate. And the studies have shown that the failure or the need for you to escalate to intubation is dependent on the ROC scores at the certain hours of your high-flow nasal cannula use. So we use this as a parameter whether we are failing in the high-flow nasal cannula and we needed to escalate our therapy for these patients. So if the patients are improving on the high-flow nasal cannula, meaning their saturations have improved, there's no acidosis, and the ROC scores are on target, then we place this patient on a uh, awake positional recruitment maneuver or what we call a self-cloning together with the high-flow nasal cannula. So there are a lot of ways of doing your self proning and this is one coming from the Intensive Care Society looking into how they do their conscious proning. Some call it spanking. So one of our fellows devised this nomenclature or this um, um, quick, easy way of remembering how to place your patient. So ripples, so that's right recovery position. And then you place this patient on a protected prone. We use this pillow. These patients actually place their pillow, their face on this pillow so that they would be protected from pressure sores. Then we place this patient on a left recovery position. And finally, a seating supine position. We do not allow our patients to really lie flat on their backs. And we do this, do this for a maximum of about two hours and a minimum of 30 minutes. Uh, easy for us to describe. However, it is very challenging because some patients... Have um, do have problems with proning. Some of them are not really um, uh, adapt to, to doing proning. Some of them have big bellies. And if you have big bellies, it's very difficult for you to actually assume a proning position. So what we recommend for them, if they're unable to do prone, they at least do the recovery positions and the sitting supine in, in uh, most of the time. Okay. So if the patients on high-flow nasal cannula are actually failing, then we assess the need for intubation. Again, um, once we are able to have that approval for us to do our full face mask, we would have that bridge of doing non-invasive ventilation for some of these patients. But right now, if the patients fail in a high-flow nasal cannula, we immediately intubate this patient. Um, this is the Venti project by one of our colleagues, Dr. Christan, and looking into using this full face mask and uh, having that um, added contraption there to separate the airflow and ensure that it's a tight seal. And we are able to connect this to our ventilators and provide all the pressures that is quite needed for non-invasive ventilation. I've been testing this with different ventilators that we have uh, in the Philippine General Hospital as well. So you see there's a two-limb uh, structure as well. The exhalation and the inhalation ports are separated by this patented um, conduit that had been placed in this particular mask. Now, if the patient, the, then the need for intubation, again, would be any of the four parameters that we have set forth at the start, or if they're, the patients are failing, or right now we noted that we would use a PF ratio of less than 100 in, instead of the usual less than 200 for us to decide whether this patient should be intubated or not. And this comes from our data during our last mortality and morbidity review showing to us that there are indeed patients below 150 
between 100 to 150 PF ratio that we were able to support with high flow nasal cannula with um, outcomes that are quite good. And when we intubate our patients, we call our an anesthesiologist. They have the protocol for rapid sequence intubation. And once these patients have been intubated, we initiate our ventilator settings. We do our volume controlled respiration. Our tidal volume has been placed on eight mils per kilo, a peak flow of about 50 to 70, peep of about eight initially for our patients with BMI of less than 30. For BMIs of less than, more than 30, we usually place it at 10 in 100% FiO2. Our targets remain the same, a saturation of 92 to 96, a PaO2 of above 65, no hypercarbia, uh, uh, ideally a PCO2 less than 45 and a normal pH. Adjusting our ventilators, we look into our plateau pressures. We keep our plateau pressures below 30 and our driving pressures below 15 centimeters water. When we see that our, we are on target, we maintain these patients on 8 mils per kilo. But if we see that the plateau pressures and the driving pressures are high, we reduce our tidal volume to about 6 mils per kilo uh, IBW. Now, we increase our PEEP by increments of 2, provided that our limits for plateau and driving pressures are kept within targets. And if we're unable to reach our targets, we initiate any of the following. We do sedation. We have a sedation protocol in place. We paralyze this patient and do early proning. If for some reason this patient cannot be prone, then we do APRV in, mo in some of these patients. Our ventilators do have capacity for APRV uh, mode. We still don't have ECMO, but this is something that hopefully will be available to our institutions in case that we are unable to be su uh, successful with all of these other two um, set of um, management that we have. So why do we do prone positioning in our patients? The studies on ARDS have shown that prone positioning does increase uh, chest wall elastance. And um, they have shown that this particular portion, the lower zones that are affected by ARDS is actually not um, fixed. And they can, uh, they can be moving around when you place your patients on the prone positions. So proning decreases the compression of the lung tissues in the dependent lung zones. It allows you to have a more homogeneous ventilation. And the impingement of the structures on the lungs by the heart is also removed when we do prone positioning. But more than that, I think the reason why proning works is the concept of shape matching. And I think this is the reason why even for patients who are on self-proning or are awake can benefit from proning. So you have to look into your lung. Uh, ideally, if the lung is a conical structure, but being a conical structure, it has to be placed in a cylinder, which is your chest cavity. And for the lungs to occupy areas of that cylinder, there should be an increase in the uh, size of the alveoli in those parts of the area. So this is um, what happens in your patient. And then the blood flow, again, we know that the blood flow is towards the um, ventral part of your of your uh, towards the back part of your of your uh, of your lung. So, um, we, with patients uh, on prone, what will happen is that when you place your patients on prone, the the blood flow remains to be the same, but with the proning, you're able to exert a pressure by gravity and shape matching on these the dependent portions are the ones on the uh, anterior part of the chest and with the increase in the alveoli at the back part of the lungs. So with the increase in size, you're able to slowly um, compress some of this one and allow a bigger uh, distension in the back part of the lungs. And this gives you a more homogeneous lung. The structures, again, the sizes of the alveoli tend to be of equal sizes, and you're able to distribute both the pressure and the volume in this patient. This is probably the reason why proning, even in the self-proning, um, awake proning, works for some of our patients. We have proning pillows for our patients. The blue ones are the softer ones, so we use them for awake proning of our patients. Um, if the patients have an NGT, there's a conduit there which they can place their NGT there easily. 
Um, we use the gray ones for the patients who are on ventilators because uh, this is third year and when the, these patients are, are sedated and paralyzed when we prone them, um, the weight of the head actually compresses this too much so we need a relatively sturdy um, proning pillow for this particular group of patients. We have encountered facial pressure ulcers so our um, colleagues from plastic surgery has devised us with ways of preventing facial pressure ulcers for our patients and they have guided us on how to place these uh, duoderms or these um, pads that can help prevent pressure ulcers for some of our patients. Other ancillary care that we do for our intubated patients is limiting any breaks in our system. So we prevent um, ETs getting dislodged by placing them on, on ET holders already. Uh, we don't use ET ties anymore or leukoplast to, to attach or to secure our ET in our patients because the, leuco the ET ties can dislodge and we don't want dislodge ET tubes. We don't use leukoplast because they stick to the gloves of our healthcare workers and they can create breach in their PPEs. We have uh, closed suction systems in our patients so that we mitigate the potential of aerosolization during suctioning. We use mucus straps if we need to um, obtain uh, endotracheal aspirates for our patients. And again, we are able to deliver bronchodilators through a contraption through an MDI port that we can place in our patients with uh, ventilators. Now for anticoagulation, before we were following the usual ICU care with VTE prophylaxis and treatment for proven VTE, but for the past weeks, we have been seeing and picking up patients with uh, um, venous thromboembolism, both DVTs and even those with pulmonary embolism. So right now, the section has moved towards the severe and critically ill patients are given 40 milligrams of low molecular weight uh, heparin and oxaparin twice a day if without contraindications. For the moderate risk patients, and maybe they can be placed on a once a day prophylactic dosing. And those with PADUA scores of more than four or equal to four are given 40 milligrams once a day of subcutaneous enoxaparin as well. We win our patients similar to non-COVID cases when it comes to looking for readiness to win. But instead of doing TPs, we now do um, CPAP weaning uh, we do closed system for spontaneous breathing trials. We do not also do cuff leak tests anymore because we, we are fearful of the potential of coughing and aerosolization for our healthcare workers. We have an extubation protocol in place already wherein we do a mask over tube technique when we, intubate our, when we extubate our patients similar to the ones on your video screens. And we place, again, a surgical mask on top of this face mask to limit dispersion later on. So there are a lot of challenges that we have seen also in the recovery phase. The tracheostomies have um, some delays uh, because we are making sure that our patients are COVID negative already based on their RT-PCR before we subject them to tracheostomies. And this is keeping in line of making sure that our surgery team will be protected. We do see that these patients are staying on the ventilator longer than usual. So we see deconditioning and muscle wasting. And we have now collaborated with our Department of Rehabilitation Medicine to initiate again their um, bedside rehabilitation or physical therapies, even in our COVID patients. We've been looking into uh, increasing or maximizing their nutrition support and this phagia screening for this patient as well. And a lot of these patients also do need psychosocial support, especially that they have this condition and they have been isolated from their relatives for a very long period of time. We do have access to experimental COVID drugs and we follow what the PISMID guidelines have been telling us. So this is from the PSMID on, on how to use or when to use your hydroxychloroquine and uh, lopinavir, ritonavir. And this is when remdesivir is available. So right now, the institution is taking part in the solidarity trial. So because we are part of that trial, we now have access to remdesivir for our patients. Now for our patients who have been on really bad ARDS, we are able to use tocilizumab 
for these patients when we feel that there is a cytokine storm that is happening in our cases. And these are our guidelines or guidance from tocilizumab use from the PSMID. Again, we use the ferritin as one of our markers. A ferritin of, of more than 1,000 is already an indication for us that maybe we should be placing this patient on tocilizumab. Uh, more often than not, these patients will receive uh, two doses of tocilizumab when they are really severely ill. And this is the dosage that we use for tocilizumab. We use about 4 to 8 mils, milligrams per kilogram single dose. So that's about 400 milligrams IV as an infusion um, at the first day. And then another extra dose can be given after 12 hours at the discretion of the clinician. So when we see that our um, blood gases or the patient's condition is not improving on our biomarkers are not really going down, we give a second dose for our patients. There are other therapies available to us in the Philippine General Hospital. Again, the clinical trials from the Solidarity were part of that. There are other trials coming into the institution. We have access to tocilizumab. Um, we do use sometimes corticosteroids for some of the patients, but if we use them, they are very limited period of time, about three days. There are uh, available hemoperfusion. So our experience have shown that patients who have been on cytokine storm if we give them tocilizumab and combine with hemoperfusion, we give them a better chance of improving. We have access with convalescent plasma. However, our convalescent plasma use in the institution is now for, um, uh, for the therapy in, um, as a last resort. So we, I think convalescent plasma should be used earlier rather than as a um, last resort measure for some of our patients. And then IVIG is being explored by the group of the allergen immunologists that we have in the institution as well. So what have we learned in the past four months? So first of all, do no harm. So I think this is the reason why our, our management has changed from early intubating this patient and now trying our ways to monitor these patients closely and ventilate and um, provide oxygen support to this patient and looking into whether there is really an uh, clinical indication for intubating this patient. We do inform consent for a lot of the procedures and also for the experimental COVID medications that we have. Management should be a team approach. There should be other people handling logistics and the equipment use so that the people working into the clinical part of the management in the front lines will be spared of this. We needed a lot, uh, an arm as well as doing the rapid appraisal for the evidence that can be used for us in the front lines. Um, we do a lot of multidisciplinary discussions. Our morning endorsements have been joined by multiple specialties already um, because we needed a lot of inputs from them on how to properly manage and guide our direction in, in managing these cases. We have to be open to new ideas and new innovations as they come into to the open. We improve and enhance capacity. So we do a lot of, the equipment has come in, the infrastructure has been improved, but we also need to increase skills of our healthcare workers. So we do a lot of simulations for them and looking into whether they're able to deliver all of these um, procedures that we have. So the ICUs right now are very much adept with proning compared to how they were even years ago. We need to collaborate and coordinate and have an open communication with the various units within the hospital and of course other agencies as we try to triage some of these patients and have the very strong referral system to our hospital and from the hospital. And part of collaborating and coordinating also is conducting researches that may be useful or will be useful in our eventual management for these patients. And then as evidence emerge, there's a need for us to critically appraise all of this evidence and check the applicability to the local setting that we have as well. And if there's one thing that COVID-19 has taught us is that we really need to be very patient um, with the management. Uh, the, lot of, a lot of our patients cannot be hurried with their progress. And we just really need to support them as they slowly recover from this uh, condition. And this, I think, is summarized better by his Professor Gattinoni telling us that all we can do ventilating these patients is actually buying time with providing minimal additional damage to them. 
and the meaning the lowest possible tip and the gentlest of the ventilation that we can give to this patient. And we really, really need to be patient. And that is the end of my slide. And again, uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Albay, uh, for that excellent um, presentation. Um, we did run out of time, but I think uh, we do uh, deserve uh, maybe an extension, if that's all right, sir, uh, because I'm pretty sure, and I'm seeing a few questions already. That was an information okay. pack uh, presentation. Uh, if it's all right, sir, just maybe around five okay. to 10 minutes. Yes. All right, so okay. uh, maybe I'll begin by asking um, from Gary over at the regional office. Um, Gary, do you have a reaction to the presentation from uh, the experience of a clinical management in a national hospital? Gary? Uh, Dr. Albai, that was an excellent presentation. I, I really liked uh, your rational approach um, that you're using. Um, you, you said a, a learning approach you're doing the rapid appraisals. Um, the materials that uh, you're developing, um, I found uh, very impressive um, that you're, those things that you're adapting. I think you mentioned maybe when some of your fellows working on adapting some and making some uh, new protocols um, based on some uh, innovative uh, techniques that have come out. So yes, I'm, I'm very impressed. Thank you for the presentation today. Right. So on to the questions. Um, first question, which is, has a lot of upvotes, uh, 15. So Dr. Albay, in, an anonymous attendee is asking, in teaching hospitals, do medical clerks or interns have any role in the management of COVID patients, or is it better that they are pulled out to non-COVID wards, sir? Um, I think as of this time, um, the clerks and the interns are not in our COVID areas. So um, I think the university is looking into how they can learn as well, but minimizing their exposures, of course. So, but um, we still don't have any directions uh, with regards to them coming into our COVID areas. So what are the people inside the COVID areas are all the healthcare workers. We do not have any students there. Uh, as of now, they would really have learning coming from there as well. But um, of course, the question has always been how to minimize exposure with them. And also, we wanted to limit the number of patients, uh, people inside the COVID areas because of the PPE usage as well. So we wanted to conserve the number of PPEs we're able to use. Right. So from the St. Luke's Medical Center, the question is, um, good morning, how do we suction COVID-19 patients on the tracheal mask? Okay, so if you suction, um, we don't have any protocol on how to do that, but usually what is happening, if you have a, a tracheal mask on top of that, um, you might be able to limit dispersions by making sure that that mask is still there when you do your suctioning in your patient. Um, of course, your personnel should be on PPEs because this is an aerosolizing procedure. Uh, it might also help if you have those acrylic boxes that can limit dispersions as well. All right. Um, Dr. Vanessa Yap has a question, a general question, sir. What are the outcomes of the ICU patients in PGH overall? What have you been observing when their outcomes? Um, our outcomes have changed throughout the weeks. So I would tell you that within the first month, a lot of the patients were getting intubated and we really have a poor outcome when it comes to intubating patients. But as we get more, in for, as we get better with the management, the game changer was actually shifting a lot of these patients to the high flow. And those, these patients who have been on high flow, again, even if their PF ratios are in the 150, they're able to survive. So a lot of our patients with high flow nasal cannula did survive um, this uh, condition. We have been um, getting better with putting patients who are intubated and uh, extubating them eventually. However, the problem I think is uh, the course of these patients are quite prolonged. So throughout the weeks, there are a lot of other conditions that do set in. Uh, 
hospital acquired infections come into play and this is adding on to our delays in extubating this patient as well of course as their deconditioning um, but overall i think the numbers that we are seeing are still quite compatible with the mortality figures that are being placed on severe and critically ill globally. Thank you, sir. Um, just a quick message from Sylvia Bernardino. Um, thank you, Philippine General Hospital Healthcare workers for your dedicated work, and we pray for your continued learning and protection. Also a message of thanks from the Las Piñas General Hospital a Satellite Trauma Center. Thank you for the very informative webinar. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, can we prevent cytokine storm in COVID-19 patients? Could the storm be causing the inflammation seen in the lungs? I think that is uh, an area that needs to be really explored, whether the cytokine storm can really be halted. Um, there was a grand rounds that was um, conducted by one of our colleagues from allergen immunology telling to us that maybe some of these immunomodulating therapies are better placed at the early part of that cytokine storm before the snowballing effect. So I think that's a very interesting thing to do. Um, maybe like, for example, convalescent plasma should really be um, placed at the early part of the management rather than compassionate use. Right now in PGH, it is compassionate use. So when all else fails, it's a time that we consider our convalescent plasma. But I think the move, if you look into where convalescent plasma will work, I think it should be at the early part of the condition, even before the cytokine storm sets in. Once the inflammation has been starting, it should be there. So there are, other, there are therapies that are geared towards that part. But again, because this is an area of research, um, it has to be in a protocolized setting. And we're really waiting for that protocol coming from our hematology uh, division to look into whether we, um, we can place uh, convalescent plasma out of that compassionate use and moving it to an earlier part of the management that we have. It's a very good point. Uh, and the next question actually touches on um, the available treatments. So Lalaine Mortera is asking, are there COVID patients who refused some treatments and how would you manage them? How did you manage them if ever there were some refusals? Um, that's the reason why informed consent had to be placed there. There are patients who really uh, do not want to be on the COVID experimental therapies. So once these things are, are, we don't have a consent, we cannot do anything about it. So we just continue managing the parts that are available or that the patient consents to us. Um, the thing about consent as well is that it's, uh, it's an evolving document. So sometimes your patients will not consent now, but uh, after a few days, if you talk to them again, then they might be open to, to that particular therapy that you have. So very important is that we do consent. Again, we do have refusals. And um, the only thing we need to do there is really inform them of all their choices. Right. Um, next question from an anonymous attendee. Do you continue tuberculosis medications for a patient uh, with COVID-19 who has active tuberculosis? Yes. Uh, we still continue our TB treatments for these patients. Uh, we do not withhold these TB medications unless we see any contraindication or any uh, adverse reactions. But if there is none, we continue TB treatment. Right. Um, a quick a message um, from a user with initials SSD. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alba. You were able to explain almost everything that uh, I want to know or learn about COVID-19. I hope one day we could have that kind of uh, comprehensive learning in a pediatric age group. So I just wanted to mention uh, at this point that on Friday, the topic is going and pregnant patients who have uh, COVID-19. So stay tuned. Uh, the same time, 11 o'clock on Friday. Now, um, maybe one Last two questions are related to Dr. Obai's uh, presentation. So uh, an anonymous attendee is asking, sir, after giving tocilizumab and the inflammatory markers remained elevated, do you recommend giving methylprednisone therapy? 
Uh, again, it depends on the condition of the patient that you have. These therapies are available to you, then you can do that. Uh, what we do in our institutions, because we have access to hemoperfusion, we consider placing these patients on hemoperfusion as well. Uh, if there are no contraindications to giving methyl pred, then we add on methyl pred to our treatment. But again, the duration for methyl pred that we give is about three to five days only. All right. Um, another question. Um, this time, sir, on rehabilitation. Um, in the PGH, do you do rehabilitation exercises uh, to COVID patients? Uh, what, what's in the area of rehabilitation? What is being done, sir? Um, so I think the rehabilitation department has initiated a limited rehab program for this particular group of people. Um, of course, we don't want them getting exposed too much and the PPE usage again is an issue. So our nurses are doing passive range of motion exercises for them. So that's something that can be clustered into the care of this patient. But our rehab uh, department is looking into maybe doing two or three sessions a week for these patients at a limited engagement. And um, because we have access to telemedicine, so they usually do some telemedicine as well to assess our patients. And again, the, their protocol is evolving and something that um, needs to be adapting throughout, throughout the weeks and the months that we have this COVID-19. Thank you, sir. And the last, very last question, uh, this is related to the ongoing uh, research perhaps or studies on the WHO Solidarity Trial. Um, so Ms. Carmela Barcelona is asking, following through on the question about patient outcomes, in your experience, and I say this to emphasize that this is only in the experience of uh, PGH and Dr. Albay in particular, how have you seen, uh, the re what responses are you seeing among the patients who are using or being administered the treatments uh, like uh, under the solidarity trial, the hydroxychloroquine, the, the other treatment arms, sir? Um, I think the better person to, to answer that would be somebody from our infectious disease service. Because again, the ones we are seeing are the ones who are severe and critically ill. But they do see a lot of these moderate patients that have been also placed in the solidarity trial. Uh, again, our numbers are still consistent. Our mortality figures are consistent with what is globally being shown for the severe and critically ill. So we do welcome the solidarity trial because finally we have access to remdesivir because something that we don't have access for the past months. We do have access for hydroxychloroquine and the retolipolnavir, but we did not have access to the remdesivir. And I think over the next few weeks, we might have access as well to the interferon if that will be approved in, in this country as well. I just saw, sir, in the chat box, uh, Dr. Eileen Wang, who is also uh, participating in, uh, in the lecture she attended, she mentioned that the uh, interim analysis is now being done for the solidarity trial. Dr. Eileen Wang is one of the senior uh, consultants and colleagues of uh, Dr. Albay at the Philippine uh, General Hospital. So the time now is um, 12.13, and uh, this uh, may be last administrative question, sir. Sir, I, I've been getting a lot of messages asking for a copy of your slides. Will it be okay if we could uh, share the slides to the participants? Like, uh, we could have a PDF uh, process. Is that all right, sir? We will just send it to you. Okay. All right. So we will work on that. And uh, on behalf of uh, WHO, um, the regional office and the country office, we'd like to thank uh, the Philippine General Hospital and Dr. Albert Albay Jr. in particular for the very well uh, delivered uh, presentation that was really a lot of information uh, we can tell uh, just to give a recap on the number of participants and there was a score for for webinar uh, like uh, staying power so we began with around 300 participants at the peak of around 382 um, and still right now we have 346 uh, listening into us and all giving thanks and uh, well wishes, sir, for uh, continued, uh, you know, safe health uh, as you do your practice in the Philippine General Hospital. As we heard from Dr. Albay, he is just on break and coming Monday next week, uh, if I remember, uh, he'll be back in the ICU together with the other healthcare workers of the Philippine General Hospital. So with that, um, Gary, do you have any last words before we sign off? 
Yes, uh, I want to thank Dr. Albay again for the uh, great presentation. I, I learned a lot um, also. Um, I'm looking forward to the uh, next several presentations, especially the one um, that's going to be coming from the uh, private hospital here in Philippines in addition. So thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Albay, uh, final words for me, sir? So I think, uh, again, thank you very much to the WHO and for inviting me, Albert, to this particular uh, webinar. And I hope um, with, with webinars like this, we will learn a lot and hopefully um, be a step closer towards uh, eradicating and fighting COVID-19. So thank you very much to everyone who listened. Thank you so much. And to everyone uh, tuning in, uh, stay safe and good afternoon. Bye-bye.